Torque procedures and parameterized queries are both considered essentially perfect defenses against SQL injection because they make it impossible for the data that comes from the user to be misinterpreted as an active command. It's just data. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, all right, so what attack uses dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash? Command injection is directory traversal. Directory traversal is the main one. Um, I'm going to have to think about command injection because you can, in fact, traverse to a command and execute it. So I might, but anyway, that, that, the general category is, is called uh, directory traversal there, where you go travel out of the website directory over somewhere else. So what is the LDAP set? LDAP is um, used to transfer directory information on a Windows domain, and you can attack it with an LDAP injection, which is like a SQL injection. But it's not the, the path. No, it's not. It's not the path. The directory traversal is where you go to a URL and you add stuff up here with dot dot slash dot dot slash, and you go to some file that the person here did not intend for you to get to, like Windows, System 32, this sort of thing. Actually, you command, so you dump out the passwords or other things into your vulnerable to directly traversal, which means your web server has not been set to forbid that. Your web server ought to be set so it's only allowed to access files in the web directory and not in the All right. So, risk management. Um, here's some terms you should know. So a threat is just something bad that might happen without a statement of how likely it is or anything. Um, so you might have earthquakes or humans might do something bad, like your users and your administrators might make a mistake, or attackers might come to you. There's many kind of possible things that happen. Um, one really important issue is insider threats. I, I had an opportunity to go to a conference about insider threats at Rapid7, and I gave a talk there about our insider threats here at this college, and three quarters of the people in the audience told me that their biggest um, disasters at their company have also been caused by insiders. You think about attackers and hackers and everything, but your own insiders doing terrible things is much more dangerous, and that's never, that's always been the case. I heard this, I think I was told at least 30 years ago that most businesses in America fail because insiders steal stuff. Mm -hmm. And most employees steal from the boss, if, at some extent for another. So it's a big problem, because the people in your company, they already have passwords, they already have privileges, so it's really hard to stop them from doing bad things. Anyway, um, there's lots of things that happen out there. People do it out of greed and revenge. Um, so if you want to prevent this, there's quite a few techniques that will help you. Um, least privilege is the general one. So people should not have the privilege to do what they can't do. Like I mentioned, if you want to stop directory traversal, the web server process should only be allowed to go in the HTML folder. It should not be allowed to go over into the C Windows system folder. And then nothing they do inside that process will go outside where they're supposed to be. You can do that to your employees, too. The people who are answering the phones, taking orders, should only be allowed to run the programs on their machine. They shouldn't be allowed to access the payroll system or the repository of passwords or credit card numbers or anything. They should just be allowed to do what they need to do to get their job. That's least privilege. Job rotation is where you take people and force them to switch jobs periodically. Like every six months, they have to move this way. No one person gets to own one job and start working the system. You find some way to hide the money and divert the money into some slush fund. So when they leave that position and someone else comes in, they would discover that. Um, mandatory vacations are very similar. You force people to take time off so someone else has to replace them, and then the replacement has to look at everything they've been doing and figure out whether they've been doing it right. Uh, separation of duties is, again, a similar technique where you take a job that one person could do and you force everything to be reviewed by a second person before it takes effect. This is typically done for paywalls. So the company Autocat, they would do this for any money that went out. And did this for all database manipulations, which I did, and in fact, I quit the company when they took out the other database analysts. And I was a database administrator, and there were others, and nothing left without being going through two database administrators, but then they fired all the others and wanted me to operate alone. And I was going to handle like $50 million funds all by myself with no backup, and I said, no, I'm going to leave. This is not a good place to be, because <laughs> um, I'm not perfect and I'm not pretending to be. I didn't bother arguing with them because they're idiots, so they said, you know, I think I'd rather go teach college. But, Point is, uh, you don't have anything really important done by just one person. Now, another person has like two signatures on checks, which is a very common control. Thing. And that worked, I think, at the University of Chicago. 30 years ago, I heard about the University of Chicago, the guy running the uh, donation, the alumni fund, where all the graduates contribute. He was taking the money and just spending it on drugs and hookers and stuff right out on the street, right with checks, by signing them himself. And then, 
the, the college sued the bank and said you shouldn't cash those checks because they should have had two signatures and they only had one and they actually got the money back because the bank was not supposed to honor those checks with just one guy signing them for exactly this reason. Mm -hmm. Somebody else has to agree that you really should be spending that money. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so um, you have to do threat modeling to decide who you're trying to protect yourself against. Um, this was very well explained recently by Miko Hakkonen in a TED talk because as we all know, every major company in America got hacked by the Chinese. And yet they've all been paying millions of dollars to antivirus companies and firewall vendors and saying, say, 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 wait, we paid you, McAfee and Norton and everybody paid you all this money and you didn't save us. What's wrong with this? And he explained, we can't protect you from nation state actors. If James Bond wants to kill you, you cannot save yourself with McAfee antivirus. And you aren't going to ever prove that it'll save you from a nation state actor. They have unlimited funds, they have experts, they have zero days, they have tremendous resources and talent, and they can pack through everything you produce. All they can do is save you from crooks. Crooks aren't really that smart, and they aren't really that dedicated. They're trying to steal your money. If you make it a little difficult, they'll go steal somebody else's money instead. That's what antivirus can do for you. Mm -hmm. It can scare away a certain level of attacker. But if a nation state actor wants to, wants to attack your company, and they're determined to really do it, then you're toast. Right? You can't stop them. You couldn't stop our military either if they really wanted to get you. Um, so that's what you do. You have to consider your threats and decide what threats you can protect yourself against and not waste your time on the threats that you can't stop or that aren't really important to stop. So vulnerability is something that could be exploited, a weakness of some sort in your system, which makes it possible for a threat to be realized. Um, one common one is you just have default configurations of your hardware and software. Um, you don't have any antivirus, things like that. You don't have any policies, so your employees don't really know what they should be doing and there's nobody reviewing what they do to see if they're doing it right. right? So a risk is something that has been boiled down to a measurement. Now you have the likelihood that something bad will happen. It's not just a scary sentence, it's a measure of some sort. And risk can never get down to zero. Um, people will say, I want to lock on my door that will mean you won't get burglared. Burglar. I said, well, you know, you just take a bulldozer and collapse the door and get in. And you can't afford anything that will stop that. So you can't stop every burglar. You can only stop some of the burglars. You have to go back to your threat modeling. What do you have in there and how much does somebody want it? Um, so you choose what an acceptable amount of risk is, and that's the point of risk management. You find out how much risk you want to tolerate, and you limit the risks to an acceptable level. Um, there is always some risk left over. All right, so here's basic techniques. The simplest, most common, and stupidest is risk avoidance. This is like high school. No more Facebook, no more internet, yes. no, more, no more games, no cell phones in class. We're just going to stop doing anything that has any risk. Now, this is what you do. If, if this is when people get really mad at you, you're just on a power trip, what's wrong with you? You know, it's ridiculous. But it is the simplest technique. And if you can actually stop people from doing the risky activity, then you have lowered the risk. But this normally results in people just sneakily doing the risky activity and getting around your irritating uh, rule, and therefore you haven't really accomplished much at all. But that's risk avoidance. You just stop doing whatever is dangerous. Risk transference is making it somebody else's problem. That's what insurance is for. Um, or, so it's, if it does happen, somebody else will pay for it. Risk acceptance is, of course, the most common one. Um, companies that do not have any really risk mitigation, any formal risk, um, risk analysis procedure, they're doing risk acceptance. You just take the risk. And this is why um, I think studies have shown half the businesses in America have no disaster recovery plan at all. The disaster recovery plan is if there's a disaster, they go out of business. That's it. That's risk acceptance. And you can do it by just not planning, or you can do it by carefully considering and deciding the risk is not worth fighting. Um, and risk mitigation is where you do something to limit the risk. You add something, typically that costs you some amount of money, like guards or antivirus or firewalls or something to lower the risk. And then there's risk deterrence, which is something that will lower risk by just sort of scaring away the attacker instead of really stopping you. Like if you put up a sign saying there's a dog and there is no dog, that's risk deterrence. It doesn't actually stop an attack, but it might scare away some of the attackers, and therefore it has some effect of lowering your risk. Um, so risk assessment is first you have to decide what you're trying to protect and how much it's worth. Then you have to decide what threats there are against it and what vulnerabilities you have. And then choose to prioritize them and then recommend controls. That's what risk assessment is. Then you can scientifically choose the controls that are delivering the most value for your company and not waste a bunch of money trying to stop things that are not worth stopping. Um, a quantitative risk assessment is the best if you can do it, where you can boil this all down to how many dollars per year are we going to lose from this problem. And this is the only equation on the CISSP, on Security Plus for that matter, I think. The annualized loss expectancies, the single loss expectancies on the annual rate of occurrence. Um, 
So if your employees lose laptops, and therefore you have to buy new laptops, and they cost a thousand bucks, and um, one employee loses a laptop each month in your company, then you're going to lose 12 laptops a year, so that's $12,000 a year you can expect to lose from your employees losing laptops. And that's it. Now this, by the way, is a pretty stupid risk analysis because if your employees are losing laptops, the cost of buying new laptops is the least of your problem. The big problem is the data that was on those laptops, which is going to lead you into a world of trouble if it leaks out. But that's not included here. And so either this is only considering just one issue, or you'd like to think perhaps there's encryption on the laptops and you don't need to worry about that or something. But anyway, that's of course always a problem with all these analysis. You have these beautiful numbers, and if the numbers are based on stupid assumptions, then the numbers are stupid too. But that is how you do it. Um, a qualitative risk assessment is probably much more honest in most cases. Like, for example, suppose you do lose a laptop full of data. Now how much are you going to lose? Well, you can't put a dollar amount on them exactly, but now people don't trust you. Um, so you have to guess how bad it is. Anyway, so now you judge things like high, medium, low, or a numerical scale of some sort, just so you can rate the more dangerous thing, the less dangerous thing. Um, so if you consider attack on a web server, um, a web server is highly likely to be attacked because thousands of people are accessing the web page all the time. And if you have a lot of damage if somebody defaces your web page or takes it down. If somebody messes with one workstation like one of these, that's not very likely and it wouldn't matter much if it did because the users can just use the next one instead. So that's the kind of thing to when you consider. It's probably worth spending a lot more money protecting your server than to protect every workstation. Um, so you document this thing, you make a report, and you keep it confidential because the report obviously lists all your weaknesses and all the things you decided probably weren't going to happen and you left those doors open and that would be helpful to attackers so this document should be kept confidential. Tests by hand are also necessary if you want to really find them thoroughly. Penetration tests are another way to find vulnerabilities that gives you more information in depth but less information in breadth. I've got one specific way to get all the way to the treasure. You do not find all the holes in your gap in your, your security system. So it's a different kind of test. So typically, you start with reconnaissance. From the outside of the company, you figure out what I'm going to attack, what IP addresses do they have, what kind of uh, look at their ads, try to figure out what operating system they're running, you know, whatever, whatever they've got. Then fingerprinting, you're going to get details of individual machines, typically something like a port scanner, find an exact version of things they're running. Then you do an attack, where you take over some part of the company infrastructure, like the web server, and um, then you, and you exploit it, and typically a real attacker will then install rootkits so they can come back later and continue to own you for a long period of time. Anyway, if, uh, to find the IP addresses of your machine, you can find IP addresses lots of places, and just who is will tell you the IP address range assigned to your company, and you can even geolocate from IP addresses. There are various techniques for this. The simplest one is to just go from the IP address to the who is record, which may have a name and address, but that could be faked. There are, in fact, some cute new techniques developed by people at Berkeley and others that actually time how long it takes to reach that machine from different physical locations and geolocate it that show like sonar through the web, which can actually find people pretty well. Um, port scanning is where you send packets to the service servers on their network and get them to reply, or the routers that matter, and from that you find out what they've got. And that is the most famous one. There are many other port scanners. Um, so you'll find what ports you're listening to, that'll tell you what services are being offered. You can look at the patterns of the client and figure out what operating system they're using to a certain extent. You can find uh, known vulnerable services like peer-to-peer -peer software and such. Um, Nessus will also do this. Um, vulnerability scanners are more powerful than port scanners. A port scanner like NMAP will just send a series of probes to every port and tell you the result. It tells you what doors are open. A vulnerability scanner will then go through a whole list of attacks, trying all sorts of tests. Now, it's not taking over the machine, but it will send something to detect it has no vulnerability. So a port scanner will tell you port 21 is open. A vulnerability will scanner will say, that is an FTP server. Let me test for like 20 known FTP vulnerabilities and see if it has any known FTP vulnerabilities and give you a long report of what it finds, taking much longer and much more thorough. Um, so if you want to prevent people from scanning you or finding vulnerabilities, you can use an IDS or an IPS. This will monitor network traffic and remove things that are dangerous, at least inform you that people are scanning you. And it may stop um, them from discovering weaknesses. Web application firewalls are popular for this purpose because when people try to attack your web application or scan for vulnerabilities, all they find out about is the web application firewall. It doesn't let any of those probes through, so you do not find out about the vulnerabilities in your real website. So if you want to find vulnerabilities, um, you have to use a uh, custom 
code for each type of service, and often a special piece of software. Web servers have special software that tries the vulnerabilities on. As you know, failure of input validation is a big one, so it will find every field and try to put in things with apostrophes and quotes and then see if they got filtered out. And if they didn't, it will warn you that's a vulnerability. Try to put large things in and see if they cause buffer overflows. Um, you mentioned SQL injection, maybe form that clear to go to a database. And cross-site scripting. It just test for all these things. Email servers. Your vulnerability scanner will check to see if it can actually send an email to the email service without logging in. If that's true, you're an open email relay, and that makes you a tool for spammers. These things are pretty much all been shut down by now because spammers hunt for them vigorously and use them like crazy when they're found. So if you set up an open email relay, it's usually only a matter of days or weeks before you get a bunch of nasty grants where everybody is getting spammed from you and you get informed that you have to knock it off. Um, and if you have an application server of any sort serving off something else like a Microsoft product, like you have to change uh, web access and thinking that there are other ones out there, um, SharePoint and such, then you can try for known problems in those software like SQL Server. One common one is that you have a default install with a default and a password, but there are many other problems in this particular product. So once you attack, um, there are different levels of attackers. Custom scripts used to be sneered at, used to call these people script things, just use pre camp attacks, but then we got backtrack and Metasploit, and now everybody. Attacks with enormous effect. Um, writing your own attack is still pretty cool, but you often don't have to. You can usually take over the, the uh, anything you want to with a known attack in a canned product like Metasploit. Anyway, so there's different ways to get in here. Now, once you get in, you take it over some service, usually a public facing web server, for example, or a TV server, something that people usually take over first. And that's usually not what you really want to take over. So what you probably want to do is get passwords off that box to penetrate more deeply into the network. So you want to escalate privileges to turn yourself from a local user to root on that machine. That's one common attack you'll have. Another, now smash and grab attacks are where you just grab things and leave quickly before they lock you up. That's it. That's all you want to know. Credit card numbers, I'm leaving. This is what Anonymous does most of it. Go in, you face the website, seal the credit card numbers, then make it obvious, and that's it. They have it to it's over. It's over. Um, the advanced resistance threats or where you plant something and hide in that machine for a long period of time, this is what the nation state actors do, like China. They poison your network, and for the next years, your network is secretly sending all the data back to China. That's much more valuable to them, because they really want to continue stealing intellectual property for a long period of time. Um, anyway, one common feature you'll see is that you take over one system and pivot to take over the others. You know, take over the web servers, then you move over to the domain controller, then you move over to the database server, you wander around their network, take over the machine, your machine, machine finding goodies. Um, and another common thing you do is hide your traces. Delete the log files or even use more precise attacks and just remove the current entries out of the log files so the log still looks good but it doesn't have information about you. And that's why it's a very good idea to have a monitor monitoring all network traffic that is only connected at layer two so it's invisible and cannot be exploited. And then you'll have a record of what the attacker really did because everybody's getting attacked. 80% of companies admit they got hurt so bad by a hack last year that it, they lost money as a result. So you just have to expect you're going to get hacked, and you're going to have to have a routine procedure of dealing with it. And the first question whenever you get hacked, the first question is, are they really gone yet, or are they still doing something to us? Next question is, what did they get? How much damage did they do, and how, what do we have to do about it now? So um, it's a shame if you don't have a record anymore of what's been going on in your network, and you're trusting those log files that the attacker could have modified. So advanced persistent threats are those highly motivated, highly funded attackers that seriously want to take you over, that you can't stop with simple things like intrusion detection systems and antivirus because your attackers are too motivated and too smart. The Russian business network is a big criminal gang doing this. Um, I think they might have disbanded, but they were around for several years doing it. Um, USA does it like crazy. We did it to uh, Iran several times. Um, these are four particular attacks all targeted at Iran that we did, as far as anybody can tell. Stuxnet, Duke, Flame, Main Flame, there's lots of them out there. Wiper is another one. China did a lot of them, Aurora, and many others against uh, U.S. companies and against Tibetan um, political groups and so on. These guys were coming with zero day attacks, so there's no patch you can put on your machine to stop them. They will hide stuff under it, they'll stay in there for years. And, you know, it's very difficult for individual companies to protect themselves from this kind of thing. Um, and we're having very little success protecting ourselves from this. Everybody is pretty much owned by the Chinese, right? Um, 
So a vulnerability assessment will then look at your company and give you a complete report of all their vulnerabilities. And it will look at more than just the computers. They'll look at physical doors and your organization and so on and find out what you've got. They'll then go through your security policies and your logs, interview your people and so on, depending on the scope of the vulnerability assessment. You might want your whole company examined for how vulnerable it is. They have a long checklist they go through. Uh, the main thing I know about here is PCI compliance, Visa and MasterCard send these official uh, PSAs. Auditors just to see if you are secure enough to take Visa and MasterCard payments and large numbers. So vulnerability assessment, in the video you find out what assets you've got to protect, uh, find out how valuable they are, and then you prioritize all the vulnerability based on severities and figure out what to patch and what to leave alone because everybody has many problems, you can't fix them all. Um, so there are other techniques. Uh, you can measure baseline performance of your network and see if it changes. Um, you can review the code you're writing through creating software with either automated or manual tests to see if it's making no mistakes like failing to check inputs to creating buffer overflows. Uh, you can do other reviews of your organizational structure or design. Um, anyway, let me make this sure this clear because it seems like the book got this kind of confused. Um, Netcat is just a way to connect to another machine. It's like telling it. NMAP is a scanner you use to scan sense pros and analyzes the machine, but only far enough to find out what ports are open and what versions of products you're running and what operating systems are running. Nessus is a vulnerability scanner that will run for hours and thousands of packets and give you a detailed report of all the vulnerabilities you find. It's worth knowing these are not the same, but the Nessus is the only one that's properly called a vulnerability scanner on this list. The others are much simpler. So a vulnerability scanner will um, test your controls, the report scan, find all the vulnerabilities, and look for a whole list of known problems and let you know if they're there. Just like an antivirus scanner will tell you what you've got. An antivirus scanner is probably even a better analogy than an antivirus scanner because these things aren't really high. You run your servers, the service is a certain version, that version has a known vulnerability. It's not to require digging deep to find that. So it will then give you a long list of everything. Security errors, what patches you should have, what ports are open, weak passwords, um, what it found that's left at default that should have been changed. Um, and it might even find, if you have sensitive data where it shouldn't be, if you have a very thorough one, the general category of such work is called data loss prevention, where you have to have something on your network noticing if sensitive data is going where it shouldn't go. Um, sort of like a intrusion detection system backwards, noticing what's leaving your network that shouldn't be leaving. Right. So penetration testing, you pay somebody to break into your network. And uh, this is a, well, I, I, I see this win as the most fun job in America. Um, anyway, the other guys will do it. I'm going to talk here occasionally. Um, so you can, they will then break into your company. This may involve more than technical stuff. It may involve messing with the people too, lying to people, tricking them, uh, and so on. So then they'll find some way, to, they'll find out what security controls you have, find some way to get through them and exploit it. And then they'll have some proof at the end, like I really made a million accounts. Of one guy got in physically and he ended up posing in the server room with the network administrator. He became friends with him, convinced that he was allowed to be there. That was when he took in his photographs of him doing that to convince him that he managed to do this chest penetration test. The, the dirty little secret here is that everybody is vulnerable. All the pen testers have had good talks here. I've all told them the same thing I've heard many places, which is that a good penetration tester has a success record of 100%. He has never, ever been hired and failed to become the domain administrator. Everybody is penetrable by a knowledgeable attacker, which is a crop. And these guys are not even nation states. These guys, everybody is pretty much making the same 10 stupid mistakes over and over and over and over. Um, so before you do a penetration test, you have to, you have, to have a document called your get out of jail free card, which specifies exactly what you're doing. And they sign saying, we agree to have this done because you're totally breaking the networks, you know, for picking locks. You could totally go to prison if you haven't got permission. Then you see term what you're allowed to test. Um, for example, BART. You know, anonymous hacked BART dumped out BART's credit card numbers, except they didn't really. They couldn't get into BART. They got into something called mybart.org, which is some third-party company that sells BART tickets. They happen to have some information about people who bought BART tickets over there. Those guys weren't secure, so BART could have secured their network fine, and it wouldn't save them because they had a partner that had their data. So your pen test, your scope has to specify what exactly am I allowed to hack into? Can I hack anybody using your name or only your company, only stuff on your premises? How about your cloud services you put on Amazon? Exactly what do you want me to get into here? 
And you made great children. Um, I think I told you about Bret Hart, he talks about this one where he turned off BART. He was doing a penetration test of BART. And he found the master control switch and turned it off. They had a BART outage of all, of all the trains stopped that day, and that was him doing a pen test. You, this is the kind of stuff you've got to have covered in your contract, or you're going to have problems later. Um, so then, uh, one thing you often do is you don't want people pen testing your real system, so you put virtual machines that have copies of the system, and you test that. You often do this with the scanners like Nessus that are going to make a lot of traffic and cause things to crash. So you don't crash the real system. That's what I should have done here. And then the academic scanner in City College and brought down some stuff for a while. But at least I had permission, thank God. Um, so black box testing is where you don't know anything. You just have to figure it all out. Uh, white box testing is where they give you the information, like the network diagram, an organizational chart or something. You know. And gray box is where they give you some knowledge but not all the knowledge. And these are just different kinds of tests. Um, so the black hats are people who are criminals, and the white hats are people who don't break the law and typically have certifications and are trusted by companies and have basically licenses like the CISSP where you lose it if you violate the code of ethics. And there's a large category of people that fool themselves and call themselves gray hats, as if, as if criminals did crime 100% of the time. If they do crime sometimes, they don't do crime sometimes, they say, oh, I better than a real criminal. That's what real criminals are, guys. Criminals are guys who commit crimes when it's convenient and don't commit crimes at other times. But anyway, there's many, many people that uh, have their, their justification for what they're doing. Like, it's a political protest, therefore it's okay to dump up these credit card numbers. Yeah? I'm going to ask about the dude that hacked Hillary's account and put out all the Benghazi. What, do you know anything about that or what exactly? No, I don't know much about it. I know, um, I know was Sarah Palin. I know they got a Sarah Palin. Do something. Was that? It was Guzifer, I think that did it. Yeah, yeah. That was all the time. Uh, that was, uh, was that an official government account or was that like the Yahoo account? Uh, it, was, it was some, I don't think it was an official government account. Yeah, see, that's, that's what happened. I know what happened to Sarah Palin. They got it from Yahoo account. Mm -hmm. By guessing her reset question, see, that's why no leader should ever use uh, one of these free services free services like Gmail or Yahoo or something, because they're not secure enough. You should use your official government account for that. And that might not be secure either, but at least people know what it is, because the simplest attack there is spoofing. I could just go make Hillary Clinton at, at Hotmail and then send emails to people. And if she's known to use other emails than the real government email, people might think I'm really Hillary Clinton. So, you know, it's obviously official business should go from your official company account and not from some random third party. But anyway, that's a, uh, but yeah. People do get hacked right and left. So hackers were the original term for anybody who was just very proficient with technology and could make it do un unexpected things. It started at MIT with the MIT Model Railroad Club where they built railroads out of telephone parts. Um, but then it became a term for people who subvert security and became defined as a crime. The, for a long time they tried to say crackers are the bad guys but hackers are the good guys, but now hacking is officially a crime. However, the term ethical hacking has now become accepted and standard, I'm a certified ethical hacker, and a lot of other people are, and you can take courses in it and such. So we're moving back to this term not being considered 100% evil. But anyway, you have to find uh, language makes a big difference for government work and for degrees and such. Um, anyway, you also typically have rules of engagement specifying what you're allowed to do on your pen test. Um, this is what surprised me about Jason Street. I think I told you Jason Street had this thing where he hid in the back seat of a woman's car and told her that he kidnapped her children to get her to let him in the building. And I said, man, I, it's hard for me to believe that was really included in the rules of engagement. I mean, if you were in a test to see if you're vulnerable to that, and that woman can have psychological damage and lawsuits and everything else. Holy cow, is that really what they wanted you to do on your pen test? I, I don't know. I mean, he tells that story. I don't know if he's lying or what. But I sure wouldn't do that at a corporate pen test. Maybe you can do that kind of stuff in the military. I don't know. But. That's pretty harsh. Um, but that is exactly the kind of thing that would be specified by the rules of engagement. What are you allowed to do and what are you not allowed to do? Allowed to do I would hope not. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty, well, the, yeah. Anyway, so you're going to examine a target company reading things like news and public information. What's that? All right, that's re reconnaissance from the outside. Uh, it's not a vulnerability assessment. That would be much more detailed. You're getting a list of all of them. This reconnaissance is looking from the outside to find out what you've got here. All right, you're going to thoroughly examine a company and find all its weaknesses. Or, well, if it was perfect, you'd find them all. In reality, of course, you do the best you can. All right, that's vulnerability assessment. It's not a, just not a vulnerability scan because the vulnerability scan will only tell you about the network weaknesses. This can also look at the human weaknesses and the physical weaknesses. All right, what process will find all the services provided by server? 
All right, that's what port scanning is for. Yeah, you got it pretty much there. Port scans tell you what ports are open, and that tells you what services it's handing out, or close to it. All right, what technique will monitor network traffic looking for social security numbers? All right, that's data loss prevention. Fuzzing, by the way, is completely different. Fuzzing is sending random data to a target to try to make it crash. But data loss prevention is monitoring what's leaving your network to see if it's bad. Which is why it's a good idea, by the way, to have a mark on all your confidential data, like city, CCSF confidential. Then you can look to see if that mark is leaving. Other than that, you're going to have to try and guess the pattern of it, like anything that looks like an SSN or something. Kind of watermark your money. Yes, exactly. You watermark all your confidential stuff, and then you watch to see if the watermarks are leaving, then you know. Um, all right. So which one will put hidden malware on your machine that will just stay there for years? All right. That's what they call the advanced persistent threat which I've been told originally came from the Navy. But anyway, that's what they call this thing. The persistent threat. Something is now hiding on your network, doing something bad for a long time. 